Hello, it's Scott Manley here with the second part of my speedrun through the newly minted career mode in First Contract. So, in our previous episode, we basically got 2,500 science from the moon, and this is what we built with the cash that we had. I'm just grabbing some science while on the ground, because really the aim here is as much science as possible. In the middle, we have our main spacecraft, and on the outside, we have uh, those uh, liquid fuel boosters. The orange fuel tanks are going to provide the bulk of my fuel. I don't have smaller two and a half meter tanks. I did not unlock those on the uh, on the tech tree as you, as you may have noticed. I uh, also don't have a bunch of other things so I'm making do with what I have but I do have the nuclear engine. Now see I'm grabbing science as I ascend and I'm also taking a very steep ascent trajectory you'll notice and the reason for this is when the fuel runs out, we're just going to be pushing ourselves into orbit using this tiny engine. And it, of course, is going to get us very, very small amounts of acceleration. So we need as much time as possible to uh, let that engine push ourselves into an acceptable orbit that doesn't result in death and destruction of the entire mission against the atmosphere of the planet Kerbin. Another reason for this design is that we only have the one nuclear engine to save costs. I'm not actually struggling for cost at all, but I wanted to try and keep things as cheap as possible. So my spacecraft has a single engine after the initial boost phase, and that single engine is used for both the lander and for the actual uh, stage that is left in orbit. There we go, that is a stable orbit achieved using a ballistic trajectory to lift us as high as possible for as long as possible. A quick transfer to the moon, well, there's no such thing as a quick transfer anywhere with this because the acceleration of that engine is so slow. Looking at the estimated burn time, I think we're getting about 1.3 meters per second per second acceleration. So. That means that we're going to take, you know, 10 minutes to accelerate up to you know, Munir transfer velocity. It's a good thing I could exploit the powers of in-game time acceleration, post-time acceleration, and of course post-editing to get us there a little more quickly and a little more sanely. So I uh, tweak my orbit just a little. What I want to do is put it into a polar orbit because we want to fly over all the biomes of the moon. The moon has a total of 15 different biomes. It has Midlands, Midlands Craters, Highlands, Highlands Craters. You get the idea. Uh, because of the craters, you get a lot of different extra biomes that uh, Minmus doesn't have. But it's also a lot bigger and has higher surface gravity, so it takes uh, a little more effort to get to these places. You can't just EVA about, although actually technically you could EVA and walk anywhere on the moon once you've landed on it, but that would just be god-awful tedious that I would not want to do. Anyway, uh, putting my spacecraft into orbit just so happens that I ended up almost exactly on the day-night Terminator. I didn't really plan this, but uh, it's gonna have to do. Uh, also, this thing, I don't really carry RCS on it. I only use it for docking, so I have an interesting way of getting away from this. There we go. Do you see that? I extended the landing legs to give me a kick away from the target. Now, of course, it's spinning, so I can't re-dock. But who cares about docking when the moon is covered with more science than I can possibly imagine? So we pick a random place. I decide to land on this ridge because it's the first place I come down. And thankfully, the whole thing doesn't tip over on this steep slope. So we start filling up with science. What do we have? We have materials bay, goo experiment, seismometer, EVA while flying. And of course, we get to take an EVA while walking and a surface sample. And we put down a flag. This is the Highlands. Just because it's the first doesn't mean that there can be only one. Uh, we have a gravitometer experiment, and with the gravitometer you actually need two readings for each biome. You need one while flying and one while landed. So you need to make sure to take that reading while you're uh, just flying over the surface. It's also very useful because you can you take the reading while you're flying and find out when you're over a new biome. Case in point, we start heading south here because what we, we know that according to KerbalMaps.com, that there should be a Midlands site somewhere down this way. So I put it 
I put it into a like a low trajectory skimming the surface and then just keep using the engine to stop myself falling and getting dashed against the rocks and uh, yeah keep grabbing gravitometer data until I find that I have arrived there we go Midlands I've arrived at the Midlands all the science to be had is scattered across the surface Tis a bounty beyond which I cannot imagine or something like that so the uh, no 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 yes that was that was a very entertaining landing that I almost lost it this early in the mission although I do quick save I didn't crash or anything at any point and didn't bother uh, reloading it was quite a painless experience in terms of uh, you know embarrassing crashes and things like that so the spacecraft has trilateral symmetry right we have the fuel tanks arranged around with the uh, materials bay attached to the bottom and then the legs are obviously attached to those I mean we kind of needed something to bring the length of the spacecraft to what it is so we could stick legs on it and have the legs extend down past the nuclear engine that of course we're using um, but that means that we have three sets of materials experiments and three sets of the goo experiments and those of course only get used once before we have to return to orbit and get them, take them to the lab. Now, I mean, if you want, you could build this spacecraft a lot simpler. You know, you could have it with just one of each experiment and individually go to each biome. But I, I kind of like this. This is a balance. Of course, you could go all the way and have 15 of each. That would actually weigh more than a lab. That would weigh something like six and a half tons, and a, a lab is only three tons. So. I like to think that this is a pretty good compromise between a minimalist design that requires you to go everywhere and uh, well, and the lazy person's design that still requires you to go everywhere but doesn't require these dockings. Now because I let the moon rotate, these two orbits are on significantly different planes here and I need to, need to get them onto the same plane over the pole. Also I'm slightly ahead here so I end up going into a higher orbit. but. Fun fact here is you can see that the orbits are, you know, quite different uh, orbits here. They're quite different uh, planes. Their inclinations, though, are practically identical. Naively, if you look at it, you see they're both at the same inclination. You think they must be close, but no. No, the argument of perihelion be becomes the dominant driver of differences to or orbital planes once you are on polar orbits there. So there we go, we get them onto the same plane, I'm in a slightly higher orbit, and then it's just a case of waiting for my good friends in the space lab to catch up so they can do their maintenance on my uh, on my experiments. There we go, I ended up uh, messing things up a little and realizing that I was flying over the top of them, so I pretty much just like say, forget about it, I'm just gonna burn my way down there as quickly as possible against the background of the moon zipping underneath us silently. The desolate beauty of this body may be magnificent to behold, but sadly it's all the guys in the lab have to do. I uh, didn't give them an engine. And uh, as it happens, I didn't give them parachutes or anything else, so they're going to have to make their own way home. It's not part of the mission requirements, as it happens. Okay, so to save on part count, I don't really have any RCS tanks on this. It does have RCS tanks. I'm just going to use the tiny piece of RCS fuel which is in the capsule here. Standard RCS comes in every capsule and uh, yeah people pointed out I could have improved my previous design by leaving out the RCS and I keep forgetting to do that and uh, rarely it actually matters that much to be honest but nevertheless here we go we switch we get it into roughly the right place and then we let the RCS we just use it for terminal guidance to make sure that we translate into position and looking at this, I realize that my docking alignment is pretty lousy. Normally, I prefer to use the, the docking UI of some sort, but since this is going to be completely mod-free, we uh, do it the old-fashioned way with the camera being aligned in chase mode. Anyway, so we, we process the stuff. Incidentally, Bill and Bob are the crew in there, and once again, I bump myself away by bashing into my own spacecraft. <laughs> Ah, uh, they are gonna love that back at the insurance, uh, back at the insurance agency. 
I'm surprised there isn't a mission flag for a Kerbal Insurance Agency. I'm sure there is, that is a rich vein of comedy to be mined. So we're zipping over the poles. The thing about the poles is that all the geographic features kind of get compressed. So slopes that would be relatively gentle elsewhere become really, really steep, you know, ravines. Picking a landing spot on the poles is something of an art and requires at least some patience. So, yeah, you see me coming down here and then I'm like, okay, that slope is a little too steep. So I'm going to try and fly over and hit that ridge, as in land on that ridge, rather than collide with it at velocity and destroy my precious spacecraft. Because uh, these are two of the important biomes here. We have the poles and the polar lowlands. There is also a polar crater, which is huge. But look at that, a relatively gentle slope, which uh, is threatening to make this thing tip over. Anyway, of course, never to be uh, perturbed, we get our data, we plant our flag for the polar lowlands, and then we have to find a location for the polar highlands. Where might that be, one wonders? Well, it's just over here. I'm sure somebody can come up with a scientific reason for why the, the moon's poles are so, well, topologically interesting, let's say. <laughs> there we go. And grabbing the, grabbing the science to figure out my landing site, so I have to hit another ridge here, which will be just a regular polar location. Incidentally, I was reading a fascinating paper which suggests that the difference between the moons, the real moons, near side versus far side, is in part due to the heat of the young Earth. So if you think about it, the moon and the earth would have formed roughly around the same time and the moon would be liquid and the earth would be liquid, but um, they would cool down. Well, the earth would be giving off all this heat and essentially shining it onto the moon, so the near side would remain liquid longer while the far side would start getting cratered. And that's why, they say, the near side has all these flat maria, whereas the far side is just covered with more craters. It's an interesting theory. I'd like to see uh, more testing on it. I'd also like to see... I'm curious as to how much the mass distribution of the moon helps it maintain its orientation. Obviously, it's tidally locked to the Earth, but I think that the uh, extra mass in the Maria will tend to provide a preferred orientation due to the tidal forces of the Earth's gravity. Oh, yeah. Um, in my rush to get away in this case, I turned around and managed to knock off one of my solar panels, which was pretty hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, another quick flight takes us to the, the northern basin. And uh, yeah, it's, from this point on, you get the idea. We run to all the different locations, set everything up. Place flags. This is the northwest crater. Look at that. You can tell these things are completely different, aren't they? We have the Midland Craters. And the Southwest Crater. Flags everywhere. I'm dominating this entire moon. The Far Side Crater. Obviously, those rocks get up and talk to each other, but while I'm here, they, uh, they hide and pretend to be rocks. The Far Side Crater it has a canyon and a check into that to collect all the data there we go more canyons the moon's polar crater once again i'm pretty much hitting these in the order that they came into sunlight we have the east far side crater where the rocks think they're a little better but than those in the generic far side crater and the twin craters which have such a large difference in size it has a they're obviously a, like danny devito and arnold schwarzenegger type twins Anyway, that's us. We have got almost all the science from the moon. I may have missed a couple of readings here and there, but I am sure that I have enough science to unlock everything. And I'm wondering how many missions I will have completed in the process. It shows that I have a, a few completed missions in the top right, but honestly, I haven't been concerning myself with those. I'll deal with those later. As we're coming in for our final docking, you can see the planet Kerbin just poking out from behind the moon as it is setting. Soon, the next time we come around to see this, we could uh, head home, practically. But yeah, we're doing a little bit of work with the main engine just to put ourselves in the correct 
location and orientation before letting RCS bring us in for the final terrible docking. Yay, that's us. We have a complete package of science from the moon. Time to refuel and clean our experiments because you know what? We're going to be returning to Kerbin. And uh, if we're returning to Kerbin, we might have some more science that we can get. We might, we might as well get as much science as we can. So in order to save costs, I didn't put any parachutes on the main spacecraft, only on the lander, because we only really need to bring the lander home to actually complete the mission. Given the amount of cash that I actually have in hand, that may seem like an unnecessarily callous cost-saving measure. But uh, you, honestly, I'm thinking that at some point career mode will get tweaked here and there, and uh, I want to know what my limits actually are. So, for simplicity, I aim at the poles, because you know that you're going to hit land if you come in over the poles. You just might need to be very aggressive about your descent. I'm uh, grabbing more science as, on, as I'm coming all the way down towards the frozen landscape below me. There goes the parachutes and engines just cushion my landing. Now, how much science did I get? Over 9,000! It's over 9,000 indeed. And that, of course, with a quick bit of clicking around, is going to let me unlock the entire science tree and have science to spare. Look at that. There we go. Everything, all the science is all unlocked. 1,648 science left. And uh, yes, what did it cost us? Well, we have left Bill and Bob in the lab, serenely orbiting the moon. We can go and get those guys on future missions. Actually, this thing has enough fuel with the main spacecraft. I was thinking I could take it on a grand tour. I could go to Minmus and get all the science there. And even after that, it would have enough Delta V to do some interplanetary missions. But until we need more than 10,000 science to unlock the tree, this will be enough. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.